All right. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today we're here with Imam Isa Wood again. Um, so, I want to start off, we're going to talk about really the practical steps that can be taken that from the Quranic perspective are so significant, Imam Isa. I think when I show you these verses, uh, even you might be surprised. I'd like you to comment on these verses of the Quran that really are a number one step to not have this new world order, this you know demonic uh, Dijali system control you. And so you'll find it very interesting, um, I, I, I think, that when, uh, like, let me show you these verses of the Quran. Um, so we're looking at uh, the, this is Ayah 168 of Surah Al-Baqarah, right? And uh, if you look over here, it starts with something very basic. Uh, oh mankind, eat from the earth was halal and tayyib, pure. And don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Shaitan will take you out of this uh, lifestyle of eating halal and tayyib one step at a time, right? Don't follow his footsteps. It's not one big step. It's like little by little. And now, you know, it's getting worse over time. And he's a clear enemy to you. He's, he's just trying to trick you. And then what is the goal? He wants to command you to do evil. And indecency. And in the end, you're so deaf, dumb, blind, you'll say things about Allah which you don't even know. What's interesting is this. Of course, this is there. But what precedes it and what comes after is very similar. And that is the, the people that follow others. Okay? The, the following the leaders. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a whole subject before this, but the ending of it is, this is before these verses. The people that followed their leaders, right? We will declare uh, our innocence from them the way they declare their innocence from us. Meaning on the day of judgment, the leaders will say, well, why should we be responsible for these people? They were following us. That's their choice. Don't punish us for them following us. This is how Allah will show them their actions as a, as a disappointment over them. Okay, this is the people that will be following and, and putting excuses of why did we follow these leaders blindly. And they will be not taken out of the fire. And then after that, it mentions this point about shaitan and how shaitan is linked with what you eat and the results that he wants from that. And then it goes back to the same subject. And when it is said to them, when it is said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, meaning the command that eat of halal and tayyib is, is, is in that, right? We will follow the way that our, we found our forefathers. And then Allah says, Even if their fathers had no brains, even if and they weren't guided. And then Allah says, These are the people in the next ayah. They're deaf, they're dumb, they're blind. This is what basically the Quran is hinting that when you start eating the wrong stuff, the, you will start, you will start, you will start doing su evil things. You will start doing indecent things, and you will start saying things about Allah, meaning blasphemy things, and the, also the result of that before and after is you're going to follow leaders who are going to be deaf, dumb, and blind, and you're going to be deaf, dumb, and blind with that. So I, I just wanted that to be part of this introduction to this, to, to explain to, uh, to, to the listeners that it's, you know, it's also, and, and I really feel this with some of the brothers when I talk to them, that when you talk about the, the Jali system, the New World Order, it's almost like this romantic relationship we have with this Meaning they know it, but they don't realize uh, a lot of times they, they've missed to realize that this is all, it has spiritual roots and it's not just a political thing. Um, and so I'll just leave you, uh, you know, leave the discussion in your hands from here, inshallah. 
Um, let me stop my slide here. Okay, so you're on full view now, inshallah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Masha'Allah, 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 Sheikh Omar, this is why I watch you all the time. You know, I, I never even made those connections that you just made. And it's subhanAllah, this is suhbah uh, uh, salih, right? Like a good friend to know who can help enlighten you on some ayat of the Quran. You know, I'm going to tell you just a brief story about myself before I kick into explaining some of these important things that you touched on. Um, I used to live very close to the, the masjid um, that I kind of started my Islamic journey in. And um, I used to have the blessing of being able to attend the Fajr almost every morning. And we had this huge bookshelf. And one day, I, I, you know, I used to have a habit of just sometimes when I was bored, I would just take a Bukhari off the shelf and just read the English translation. And uh, subhanAllah, one day I came across this hadith that literally changed my life. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. So uh, let me see, I'll put this in presentation mode so it's a little bit bigger. So um, uh, for, originally from Imam Malik, um, from Qatada ibn Ribi'i al-Ansari, he said um, that he heard the Prophet ﷺ say after a murra alayhi bi janazatin, after a janaza passed by, he said, mustarihun wa mustarahum min. Okay, relieved or relieving. Hmm. And then the Prophet, uh, then the people asked, you know, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, mal mustarihu wal mustarahum min. What, what, do you, what do you mean by relieved and relieving? So he said, um, uh, Al Abdul Mu'min yastarihum min nasab al dunya wa adaha ila rahmatillah. That when a, a righteous servant of Allah is taken from this world, they're relieved of the ibtila, the tests and trials of life, and they enter into Allah's mercy. Well, Abdul Fajr yastarihum minhu al ibadu al biladu wa shajru wa dawab. But when a wicked servant dies, they are relieving the people, the land, the animals, and the trees of their wickedness. Mm. Wallahi al-Azim, from the day I read that hadith, my life has never been the same. Mm. Because it was for the first time in my life, I really understood what religion is supposed to look like, what its results are supposed to be. Mm. Because this hadith really just gives you the insight into understanding, like, look, if you're really a believer, you're a real follower of, of, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Jesus Alayhi Salaam or Musa Alayhi Salaam, then the result would be that everything around you is benefiting from you and everything is sad when you're gone. Mm. But to the extent that you fail to live up to following those messengers properly is, is that everything around you is, is punished by you being here. You're harming the land, the trees, the animals. You're, you're harming the earth you walk on. Right. Mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, when we really sit back and reflect on the life that we're living today, you know, everything down from what you wash your clothes with to how you eat, how that food got to you, how it was raised, how the animals were treated that you eat. SubhanAllah, you realize that everything in your life is harming everything around you. You're literally the person that the Prophet is talking about here, that the world is happy when you're gone until you make the conscious decision to be a person that the Quran describes as, Ya ayyuhal ladina amnu, O you who believe. Uh, and you're making islah of the situation that you're in. You're rectifying a corrupted world by making the right decisions. And, and the first, most basic thing we can start with is our eating and drinking. Like, eat and drink, the Quran says, but don't, don't become a transgressor with your food and drink, going beyond the limits. You know, subhanAllah, one of the first things that you notice so much in the day is, is the obesity, the diabetes, the heart. This is all from overeating. You know, the, the vast majority. And this is, by the way, coming from someone who used to be obese. I used to be obese. So I sympathize with anyone who struggles with eating and drinking. But alhamdulillah, today I'm not. And, um, you know, w w how many of us are implementing these, these simple basic suggestions from the Prophet Islam, Which is, you know, that, uh, you know, enough caloric intake a day to keep you alive is all you need, right? As, or as the Prophet said, a few bites of food. But if you, if you have to have more, right, then just eat a third for food, a third for water, and a third for your breathing, right? Like how few of us really are, are implementing the most basic fundamental. And what is this? One of the first books in Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya is eating and drinking, right? 
Most of us will skip that book and we're moving on to other subjects. But it's almost as if Imam al-Ghazali is telling us, no, 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 start here first. Get control of your stomach first, you know, and then you can get all this other stuff, right? So, you know, this is the typical plate in Ramadan, right? We got the, the, the month coming up and this is what we're doing. Like no, no single person needs to eat that much food. I mean, this is ridiculous. But this is, this is what's happened to us. You know, we're over-consuming, right? And this over-consumption, it creates a lot of waste, you know? And right off the bat, we're already disobeying the Prophet ﷺ. And, and we're, we're becoming a, a burden on the system, it, it, the ecosystem, so to speak. Right? So there's a couple of symbols I just want to just familiarize your audience with just so they understand the facade that has happened in the, in the food today. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So I really, everyone has seen this symbol in the supermarket here in, in, the, in the States. I don't know about the, the rest of the world. But what does it even mean? Like most people just think... By oh, the way, so um, just to interject, um, I had a chance to meet the... Uh, at, it was the, during the presidency of President Clinton. The president or the whoever is... The, the, I think they call him the president. The president of the USDA. He was a Muslim. His name was Mr. Chaudhry from North Carolina. Uh, so I, you know, I decided to talk to him about organic food versus what the FDA approves and, you know, all this whole scenario. Conventional. Convention. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I laid down, I tried to lay down. It was not, uh, it was maybe what I would consider not very well laid out arguments, but I gave him, look, you know, you know, this is happening. People are saying this, a lot of doctors are talking about this and, he said, well, you know, we're very safe and, you know, we do a lot of research before we approve anything and so on and so forth. But anyway, as I pushed him and, and I, you know, tried to like get more and more uh, trying to push his buttons, he finally said this. He said, well, OK, he's like, I'll admit that if there is a banana that's like grown, let's say, in Pakistan or, or, or some other country, it'll be a smaller banana. Right. And it will have like the, you know, the yellow might be a little bit brown, might not look as good, might not be as appealing to the eye, but it will taste a lot better than the banana that's grown, let's say here, or using all these modern, I mean, it's not even like the traditional harvesting methods, really. And with these uh, genetically modified uh, bananas that are very big, right, they look like they're like like in a, like uh, they look very uh, you can say cartoonish or like very artificial and and they don't taste as good so i dazzling think to the eyes huh? they're dazzling to the eyes they're like dazzling the, like the, the sihr of the of the yeah of the exactly. magicians of firaun yep so so yeah you, i mean you, you bring up a really good point which is that um you know we we want something that is appealing to the materialism in us but we're not seeing the spiritual reality of it. We're, we're seeing our food with one eye, right? Mm. So, so, so just quickly, what, what does this symbol mean? Well, just look at this chart. So let me, let me move my thing out of the way. Basically, if you're getting an organic uh, fruit, nut, vegetable, or grain, it means there's no synthetic pesticides, which I, I, I believe means basically no petroleum products. Um, it's not been irradiated with radiation. Uh, there's no synthetic fertilizers, which means they're made from chemicals. They're not natural. It's not been genetically modified, and there's no raw sewage used on it. Ugh. Right? But I want you to think for a moment. If it's not organic, that means one or all five of those things have been done to your food. Hmm. Subhanallah. Now, organic is not perfect, okay? Because organic still allows for, quote-unquote, natural pesticides mm -hmm. and herbicides, right? So... Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the ideal answer is that you grow your own food or you know your farmer that you're getting it from. Um, and then look at the, the one about meat. I'm not going to touch on all these, but the one about meat is fact, really... I think uh, Imam Ghazali or one of the, not just one, but more than one scholar has touched upon the fact the most halal food is the one you grow with your hands. Yes, I agree. <laughs> at least you have yaqeen <laughs> about what happened to it, right? Yeah. So, so look at the meat and poultry, and this one's very enlightening. So uh, it means that if it's organic meat or poultry, then it's had access to the outdoors. I'm going to tell you what that means in a second. It's not been irradiated. It's not been injected with growth hormone, antibiotics, or drugs. It's uh, raised on 100% organic feed, and it's not been fed animal byproducts. Now, think for a moment. 
If it's not organic, that means one or all five of these things have been done to your meat. So subhanAllah, you're going to the halal butcher, right? He's a Muslim, right? He's, you know, he made sure that your animal was slaughtered. Uh, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, a knife to the throat. Subhanallah, this, this is how a lot of our scholars, they're seeing with one eye. Right. They're only but, seeing the Sharia part. But, but here. Seeing, and I want to repeat this, is that because we know the Sharia, but we don't know sociology, we don't know politics, we don't know economics, we don't know all these other fields that interlink with Sharia and all the haram is coming from those other, other, other like fields and, 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 and destroying the spirit. So uh, the spirit of Islam in terms of food in this case. Anyway, well, not sorry. A, well, well, not only that, we don't understand basic industrial agriculture because Muslim yeah. scholars are still looking in fiqh books that were written before any of this stuff happened. So, so number one on the list, uh, They've had access to the outdoors. Do you know that in modern industrial farming, uh, pigs, which we don't need anyway, but just to, to note here, pigs, chickens, they spend their entire life in a warehouse cage about as big as their body hmm. where they never see the sunlight, never get to touch the ground, uh, pe peck around like they used to. Their, their beaks are actually chipped off so they can't peck other animals if they are allowed to corral with other animals. You know, they walk around in their own feces you know, uh, all they do is sit in a cage all day and lay an egg. Every, you know, this is a miserable existence. Hmm. And, and, and look at the other things injected with growth hormones. I mean, most people don't know this. In modern industrial farming, they, they make the animals grow so quickly that their body weight crushes their legs. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and also think about this. All that growth hormone, that gets in you when you eat it. You know, I mean, we have... This, this uh, epidemic of cancer all over the, the world, you know, um, young girls hitting puberty at really young ages, all of a sudden men growing breasts. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of just interesting things that have happened since this growth hormone has been introduced. And then, you know, I, I had um, one, of, one of the uh, scholars in the United States, I consider a teacher, Dr. Shadi Al-Masri, he mentioned even in the chicken industry, right, you, you can get a halal chicken but the animal has been abused. It's been raised on, uh, on um, chemical, uh, genetically modified food. And he said all that stuff at the very least is makruh. So you have this makruh thing, you have that makruh thing, you have this makruh thing. So you have triple makruh, but someone said bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and cut its throat. And so you're eating something that, that Allah hates. I mean, this is, this is what it means, makruh. Allah, Allah hates it. Yeah. You know, and, and so this is, you know, what's, what's happening when we don't understand these basic things and people get kind of angry. And I always like to, to tell them this, something to think about, about the price. They're like, Oh, but organic non GMO is so much more expensive brother. And I say to them, okay, uh, here's a chart um, that basically explains, and these are old prices, by the way, uh, there's really not that big of a difference, but I tell them this, I say, you know, either you can pay for good food now or you can pay for good health care later, either way you're going to pay. Okay. So, you know, invest now in good quality food, save your, your health and your spiritual well being, And then later on, inshallah ta'ala, you don't have to spend so much on your health care later on in life, you know? Um, and you know, there's a few uh, organizations that, that make this stuff. Now, let me touch on this one real quick. Grass fed. Here's another important thing that our community isn't aware of sometimes. Um, uh, an am, cattle, are supposed to eat grass. That's their natural food. But the agricultural industry wants to feed them meat, hmm. right? That's like, how it makes that cow disease. Right, because that makes them grow fatter faster. So in exchange, they made a compromise. They're like, well, the meat makes them sick. The grass doesn't, they don't grow fast enough. So we'll feed them grain. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give them corn, soybean, um, any kind of grain to fatten them up. Well, grain is okay as a treat for most goats or lambs or cattle uh, of any kind, but it's not supposed to be their primary food. It's almost like for us, kind of like eating chocolate. Like we can eat chocolate every now and again. It's not going to hurt you, but you don't eat chocolate all the time even though chocolate technically has calories and you could survive on it for a little while. Hmm. Well, what it does to the animal is that all of this grain increases um, 
a certain type of fat content inside of them and cholesterol ratio that's not good for us when we eat it. Not only that, but it leads to all kinds of pain inside of the animal because its body's growing too fast. It has the wrong kind of fat ratio. So the animal's actually in pain the entire time it's alive when it eats a primarily grain fed diet. Okay. But it makes it fatter and this is, you know, makes the price cheaper. And so we can eat meat all the time, you know, um, right. this is, I think I'd, I'd like to stop there and mention, so they grow fatter faster. It means the people that want to make money get to make the money faster and more of it. Bingo. Fatter. Okay. So it's, it's, it's compromising us for their more money. Right, and the and the health and well-being of the animal causing inflation. I mean, uh, inflammation. I'm sorry, inside of the animal. Which, by the way, when you eat that inflammation in your body, it leads to infl- inflammation inside of you. You know, you, you we are what we eat. I mean, that's 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 a very true statement. Now, now this one is really interesting. So uh, you, may, maybe people who watch you know, your, the ayah that you mentioned earlier, kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu. Uh, could also be referring to the to what we do. We do israf with the animals in terms of how we feed them, right? And uh, so Allah doesn't like that you go beyond bounds with these animals, even because you're going to eat them, and and it's going to come back to you that israf. Anyway, well, I mean, it, there, there's a proof for you right there. In who la yuhibul musrifin, right? He doesn't love people who do it. Meaning, basically, it's makru. He hates it. You know, um, and, and basically, you know, and this is not an issue of, you know, uh, Allah is not like anything. We don't, we don't describe the creator in terms of like emotional states, but what it really means is your relationship with Allah suffers. Hmm. You know, that's the real meaning that's trying to be conveyed here. If Allah doesn't love that you're doing something and you do it, that means that your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your, your, your adherence to the path to Jannah is off, you know. So, um, so here's an interesting one to think about, uh, the fair trade movement. I'm sure you may have seen these. So, so let's talk about imports for a moment. So all of the sugar, pineapples, mangoes, coffee, tea that comes into this country, uh, bananas, as you mentioned, they're so dirt cheap. I mean, just really the bananas will blow your mind at how, how, how cheap they are. Why are these so cheap? Has anyone ever asked that question? And the answer, the answer is, is because all along the way from where they're grown to how they're grown to who picked them to how much they were sold for it everyone's getting ripped off and oppressed along the way so that we can get it into the united states super cheap so an american company goes to costa rica buys up a whole bunch of land really cheap right totally wipes out the rainforest there starts planting a huge pineapple farm right and then employs children and laborers for a dollar a day, right, to go plant these seeds and raise them, hoses them down with pesticides that are going to destroy the water and the, uh, the water supply of that area, right? It's going to make the people sick. But see, they can get away with it over there because they don't have the same standards that we have in the United States. And so, you know, uh, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire in Africa, where most of our chocolate comes from, we have Muslim children picking your chocolate, right? You know, uh, it, it, we could just go on and on and on. What, what about fair trade clothing, right? So you have uh, workers being oppressed, working 14, 16 hour days in factories that don't even have air yeah, conditioning. All big companies gap and all, they're all doing uh, child labor. I mean, and who are, the, who are the children? Bangladeshi Muslim children, Right. And we're wearing these these thobes and we're wearing these kufis and and uh, undershirts that were made by Muslim children for less than a dollar a day. Right. So the fair trade movement was created to stop all this, to ensure that whatever imports you're getting, uh, that some of these things on the screen you can see have been have been respected. Like people have been paid a decent wage. Right. The land has been taken care of. Like people are not being oppressed along the way. Remember Mustarihun? Right? You know, just by eating and buying things that have had some sort of uh, oversight over them to make sure that there's no oppression, no facade, right? You're, you're becoming a person who's benefiting things around you as opposed to someone harming the world by your, by your most basic choices, right? So here's one we that... We have all this food and we're reading Quran and doing adhkar, 
it's not having that full impact that it, that it could, you know, our salawat, our fasting, our everything. Bingo. It's like uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein said, we're reciting Al-Fatiha and we're blowing on our illness and nothing happens, right? Why is our Quran not working and the companion's Quran used to work, right? And a lot of this has to do with it. I mean, there's many things involved, but this is one of the most basic. Now, here's one. Um, I, get, I, get, I get criticized a lot of, for this one, but, but I, I need to give people a little insight here. So what, what is non-GMO project verified? So what is GMO? So genetic modification. Uh, so you have natural selection, which is I plant uh, 10 apple trees. And one of my apple trees has really big apples compared to the other trees. So this year I harvest all the apples from the big apple tree and I save the seeds and I plant a new row of 10 trees next year so that they have the gene of that apple that grows biggest so that my next 10 trees will only have really big apples, right? This is just basic natural selection that's been going on for thousands of years. Nothing wrong with that, okay? This is basic science also. GMO is something totally different. This is where you actually go into the DNA of a plant or an animal and you splice it with something else. So we have an example here on the screen of what's, what's called um, Roundup Ready corn and soybean. Now, some people will say, oh, you know, Brother Isa, you're, you're against science. You know, this is just a new way for us to, to, to do natural selection faster. And I say, okay, well, let's put aside whether or not this is right or wrong, and let's talk about why it was done. Why was corn and soybean and sugar beets genetically modified? It was so you could hose them down with a really terrible chemical called glyphosate, that's an herbicide that kills everything except the corn, the soybean, and the sugar beet, and now rice, mm -hmm. right? This is a big warning to the Muslims, right? <laughs> One of the biggest rice eaters in the world. But this is so that it doesn't kill that plant, but it kills everything else. SubhanAllah, my, my uh, Arabic teacher, uh, Usted Maurice Hines, he told me, he said, this is the definition of hasad. When you yes, absolutely. want something, yes. right, you, you want your corn, you want your soybean, you want your rice, but you, but you hate that the bug is going to get it. So not only do you want the bug not to have it, you want the bug to die also. <laughs> or you hate that this, you know, um, this uh, crabgrass is going to take some of the nutrients out of the soil, right? So you, you, you not only don't want the crabgrass to have access to the soil, you want it to die in the process. So you spray pesticides and herbicides. They're the definition of hasad. And what, what's happening is that, you know, okay, number one, where is all that glyphosate going once you spray it on the soil? Right into the water supply, mm. right? Secondly, when you hose down corn with glyphosate, Roundup, okay, and maybe it doesn't kill the plant, but it soaks into the plant. And then when that food is picked, you're eating the glyphosate, which, I mean, let's just... Can you hear this? I can't hear it. No. Okay. Let me uh, let me make one quick adjustment here to the uh, to make sure that the there we go. You should be able to hear it now. So just watch this quick video. I'll I'll pause occasionally in it to comment so we don't get tagged for uh, copyright violations. Breakfast cereals and beer. Uh, I can hear it now. Okay. Trying to get it back to the beginning. There we go. This is Monsanto's Roundup. It's in cookies, breads, corn, crackers, chips, breakfast cereals, and beer. The list goes on and on and on. The active ingredient in Roundup is called glyphosate, and it's used by backyard gardeners and industrial farmers alike to kill invasive weeds. By the way, Monsanto, this is like that corporation in, in that TV show Captain Planet, right, that's always doing evil. Like Monsanto is like literally run by the shape on, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Oops, sorry. I passed the video. Sorry. This is Monsanto's Roundup. It's in cookies, breads, corn, crackers, chips, breakfast cereals, and beer. The list goes on and on and on. The active ingredient in Roundup is called glyphosate, and it's used by backyard gardeners and industrial farmers alike to kill invasive weeds. And whether glyphosate is harmful to humans or not is something of a $66 billion question. But first, what is glyphosate? There's never been a herbicide like it before. 
Glyphosate was originally introduced in 1974 by Monsanto. Its use in American agriculture has soared nearly tenfold since Monsanto introduced the first genetically modified Roundup Ready seeds in 1996. Glyphosate is now used in more than 160 countries, with more than 1.4 billion pounds applied per year. And while Monsanto lost patent protection over glyphosate herbicides in 2000, the company still has about 40% of the $8 billion global herbicide market because of what is called the, quote, virtuous cycle. Monsanto sells its genetically modified Roundup Ready seeds to produce cotton, corn, and other commodities to make them resistant to glyphosate's herbicidal effects. More sales of the GMO seeds beget more use of Roundup. More herbicide use drives up demand for Monsanto's GMO seeds. For 25 years, that cycle's enjoyed an unblemished run in our crops, soil, and food, until now. Now, Monsanto has its own invasive species creeping in, doubt. On its website, Monsanto says glyphosate is about half as toxic as table salt and more than 25 times less toxic than caffeine. More than a thousand farmers and herbicide applicators stricken with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma disagree. Hundreds of plaintiffs with cancer have filed a class action lawsuit against there the company. There you go. And okay. So that's why I'm bringing that up is that think about all of the gastroesophageal reflux disorder that you know in, in, uh, amongst people that you're friends with, which is basically a fancy word for heartburn all the time. Yeah. Stomach yes. cancer, colon cancer. SubhanAllah, this is where it's coming from and Allah knows best, right? You're eating, you're eating facade, you know, you're, you're eating poison, right? But it looks great to the eyes. It smells good to the nose, but only when you're seeing with one eye right? The eye of materialism. Once you, once you have insight basira, into how this got to you, you know, I'll just give you an example. Like um, in the Ihya al uh, there's a story mentioned of Imam al-Shafi'i, uh, rahimahullah, that he's handed a peach and he refuses to eat it. And they ask him why. He said, because I know that where this was picked in Syria and the people who picked it were Muslim, oppressed, well, wow, so he wouldn't even consume it because he knew how it got to him. Abu Bakr, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu an, he was uh, presented a glass of milk one day by a servant, and he asked her, you know, right after he took a sip, you know, where did you get this? Because he was wondering how did, how does she even have this glass of milk? She said, oh, I was hanging out with some people, and I told them about the future, and they gave it to me as a gift. And he immediately stuck his fingers in his mouth and vomited the milk up, and then made dua, oh Allah, forgive me what remains in my stool. Right. This is how scrupulous the companions were about what they ate. So, you know, it's in everything. It's hard to find any product. I mean, in all the Muslim restaurants, right? You know, they're, they're, and I, I don't believe any halal butcher or Muslim restaurant owner has any ill intentions. They just don't know what's happening. They don't know what, how this stuff has got to them. And, and, and they, 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 the halal butchers have told me, they said, brother, we'll carry organic, but no one asks for it. You know, you might one out of a thousand or one out of a hundred people might come in here and say, do you have any organic, mm -hmm. you know? And so this, our communities need to be more educated about this and not just us, but the non-Muslims as well. So, you know, you mentioned this and I, and here's another one from, from the Quran where, you know, cause Allah repeats things that are important. I learned that from you and, and Sheikh Imran Hussein. In kuntum iyahu ta'budun. So, you know, Allah says, eat from what He's provided you of halal and ta'ib things and be thankful for this ni'mah because there's going to be something that comes in the future that's going to destroy you, whereas what Allah gives you will, will uplift you, mm. you know? So, so we, we understand halal means permissible. But this word ta'ib, I believe, originally meant it was purchased with like halal money, Right? It wasn't a stolen food or something like that. But today we understand that tayyib comes takes on a whole new meaning when we just you know reflect on what's being done to our food. And and we understand that you know Allah's always puts these two together in the Quran, halal and tayyib. Mm -hmm. Right? And and the shukr that comes from you being thankful that Allah guided you to eat halal and tayyib. Mm. Right? Because you could just be eating halal but not tayyib. Right. So um, I, I guess I, if you'd like, I can take you around um, this home I'm in right now and show you, you know, some actual practical examples of really good things that you can find out there if you look. And then, 
And then, you know, one thing that I, I think is important is, you know, a lot of times we talk about the jowl and the new world order and all of these things that are happening and people become despair merchants, right? They're just like, oh, Yomo Kiyama, end of the world, forced vaccinations. Oh, we just, oh, it's, you know, uh, they're coming to get the Muslims. We're all going to be in concentration camp. Like, you know, no, let's, let's think, let's say, okay, okay, well then now that we know that these things are happening, what are we doing? What are we preparing for tomorrow? You know, the Prophet some said, plant a tree, even if you know Yom Qiyama is on the horizon. You know what I mean? Don't just sit there and just give up, you know, and how many of us, you know, we're all students of Sheikh Imran Hussein, but how many of us are actually taking his advice? You know what I mean? He's been 20 years now saying, go start a village, like grow your own food. You know, how many of us are really taking that advice? So um, I'm going to try uh, just quickly to log in with my phone. I'll show you around this place and you can see uh, some of the things that are going on, actual Muslims who are trying to, you know, take the advice of our good teacher. Uh, give me one second and I'll log in and put this in. Uh, camera mode. Hey, can you quickly tell me what is the meeting number? The meeting number? Um, sure, let me get that. Oh, it says that your meeting has been locked by the host. Oh, let me take that out. Uh, hold on one second. I can do that. Uh, Sorry for the audience. Small technical difficulties. No, it's fine. It's All right, you've been. It's unlocked now. Let's try that again. <coughs> All right, connecting. Yes, it's there. Okay, it says, please wait. The meeting host will let you in soon. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. I can't hear you very well, but it's coming through a little bit. The entire um, process to make it creamy all the way through. The problem is it's very difficult for you to digest. Pasteurization is where they boil it to uh, kill any bacteria in it. The problem is you kill all the good bacteria in it. So, this is uh, something that you can find in a lot of places if you just simply look. Now, here we're going to go outside. We're going to see where a brother has actually gotten some important things ready. Uh, one of them is keep in mind you want to buy the right kind of feed for your animals. So he's got organic feed, right? Because you want to make sure the animals are eating organic. And there's no soybean inside of this. It's just corn as well as barley and wheat. So here we have chickens, right? And I think maybe if we go inside here, we'll be able to see the milk goats. Let's see if we can find where they're hiding at. Oh, there they are. So these are called Nigerian dwarf goats. And what they are is they have the highest butter fat content of any goat that you can get a hold of. And these are mixed with Nubian so that they're slightly bigger and they produce more milk. Mm. Oh, let's go see. So, you know, when you grow your own food, when you raise your own animals, you know exactly where everything's coming from. You know what they're being fed. And you can go right outside your door. It's very low maintenance, by the way. Chickens, sheep, all these animals they don't require a lot of effort. You can get your own. Uh, you can get your own egg, right? So you just go to the chicken coop, and bingo, right there is everything you need. <laughs> yeah.
they look kind of like deer, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> so real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Get yourself some sheep, right? There's about 14 on this land right now, right? They're very low maintenance. Once you've fenced in an area, you don't really have to do much else. They pretty much take care of themselves as long as you give them water. Uh, they can occasionally get sick, but then you just contact the local vet. And these are good because, you know, all people need to do is purchase a little bit of land, you know, and then fence it in and you're good to go. So just briefly, uh, I'll show you the other animals that are on the farm. Once again, this is a Muslim family that has this here. So you can start your own animals just like you start your own farm uh, from when they're really young, as opposed to going and buying them flat out. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is only about maybe three acres of land out in the country. So you get your own garden, right? You till up your own soil, bring right. your own topsoil from the forest. You got manure from the sheep over here to give nutrients. And then you build yourself a little kook. And you can have ducks, and you can have chicks. Very low maintenance, right? And these will be laying eggs soon. And you can feed your family, and you know exactly where it's coming from. You know where everything has been. So I just wanted to show you that so that the audience... No, mashallah, it's great. It's awesome. There I are real it's people out there. At least a few brothers and sisters to, um, you know, start on this journey of both uh, uh, having farm animals, having your own farm, uh, trying to eat uh in a way that shaitan will not be as won't have that much access to us <clears throat> uh i wanted to share um something very interesting that as you were talking it came to my mind you know i was talking to dr omer and he was talking about uh how when they were making the atomic bomb there was a scientist who was a satanist i, I forget his name i read about him also at some point and you Oppenheimer. Know, what was his name? Oppenheimer. Okay, so then that person, you know, he was a Satanist and creating this bomb. He reminded me of this verse in Surah Al-Falaq. I'udhu bi Rabbil Falaq. I seek refuge in the Lord of the one. Falaq means to split. Min shari ma khalaq from the evil that they created, from the evil that Allah has uh, has allowed to be created. But this also relates to food. I was just thinking because the word is used in Quran for plants. When the plant comes out of the ground and it splits into two, so Allah says He's Falikul Habbi Wanawa. He's the one who causes the split of the seed, <clears throat> you know. So you were talking about how they're jealous. So this surah starts with falaq min sharri ma khalaq, and then ends with, of course, we all know, uh, with Hasad, right? So this can also be relating to d actually quite even more directly, even than the atomic bomb scenario, uh, to, to this whole scenario that we're talking about today. Um, anyway, I just find that interesting. Well, you know, I have a whole nother um, program that I give on uh, the screen, right? And all of the, the fit, fitting that comes from the screen. And when you start to really research a lot of the technology that we have today, you find out that a lot of these scientists were involved in ritual magic. Which is um, so interesting because they came with science to tell humanity, oh, religion's a problem. We need to think rationally. So this, is, this was their, like, uh, their, their, their front, so to say. Behind the scenes, they're carrying the Satanist agenda with science, behind science, to... You know, so they, they make God insignificant and behind the scenes, they, they had this like Satanist agenda. Um, and and I, I really am surprised with the amount of scientists, especially in the early, earlier when this whole scientific revolution was beginning, how many of the scientists were part of occults and magic and astrology and all of that. It's, it's very surprising. <laughs> right, you're absolutely correct. The uh, important thing to understand is that, um, you know, just take, for example, uh, Jack Parsons. So Jack Parsons was, you know, the person who is responsible for a lot of the, uh, what you would call uh, rocket science that ended up 
um, you know, allowing us to travel into space, allegedly anyway. And Jack Parsons was involved in ritual magic. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley. You know, mm -hmm. Aleister Crowley is one of the biggest Satanists of the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Inspired a tremendous amount of rock musicians to make a lot of uh, very devilish music. And, you know, Jack Parsons has a biography where he says that he literally contacted a demon called Belial Dejal, mm -hmm. who told him that you are doing my work for me. You know, and I often tell people, I say, you know, how does, how does Dajjal imitate God? Well, one of the things that he wants to imitate God is to be all knowing, right? And how will he know everything? Like, how will he be able to bring your, your relatives back to life and tell them to speak to you and they'll know intimate details about your life? Oh, well, that's because you've been carrying around his device everywhere you go and it's been collecting information about you for decades and now all it has to do is be accessed and all of this technology these satellites are allowing everyone to be tracked to know everything about you to know everything about your family to know what you like what you don't like where you go what you're thinking at any given time right so this technology is all being used by Dajjal uh, to create a, a, a to create and give him the abilities that make him appear to be God. But in reality, he doesn't have God's abilities. He's using technology. And, and that's once it's not, you know, we can't sit here and say that technology in and of itself is evil, but it's how it's being used. Uh, it's being used um, in a very evil way. So, I mean, that, that's important to understand, you know, and the more and more you research these scientists, you'll find out so many, many of them are involved in occult activities. It's a very fascinating subject, maybe for another video, inshallah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, inshallah, thank you so much for, um, uh, for showing us um, the possibilities of getting out this, uh, <clears throat> I can say this, the Jalik system out of the grid. Um, it is possible, and I, I really want Muslim brothers and sisters not to make the Dijali system an escapism for them. Like it's like just about politics. It's not about just politics. It's real, and it really has spiritual consequences. So I'll just end there, inshallah. If you want to say some words, uh, Imam Isa, before we end, that would be great, inshallah. Yeah, well, I mean, just just remember the the hadith, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, that there'll be there'll be uh, fit in at the end of time that are so great that the believer will go right to the places where rain falls and where uh, the mountainsides and his most beloved property will be his, his animals. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there'll come a time, you know, where it doesn't rain and, you know, we, we need to start preparing, you know, the, the great blessing about this whole uh, pandemic issue is that it's caused a lot of people to, to, to be motivated to, to change as soon as possible. And that's what we need to be doing. We, we, if, if you get any message from this video at all, it's, you know, get yourself ready. Especially uh, take, Ramadan, you know. Yeah, yeah. Take, take Sheikh Imran's advice. Number one, start reading the Quran from cover to cover each month properly. Number two, you know, invest in gold and silver. Like take your money out of the banks um, put it in real money that you can use no matter what happens to a bank. Uh, get yourself some animals if you can. Purchase yourself some land. You know, get, get together with other people, even if they're not Muslim, but they have this outlook of, you know, being mustarihun, uh, right? Like people who are benefiting the world around them, not harming it, and, and become as self-sufficient as possible. Solar panels, water energy, whatever you have to do to get uh, uh, off of the grid because the more self-sufficient you are, the less control the, the, the Jalic system, you know, can't do anything to you. But as long as we are only seeing with these eyes, right, we're going to, we're going to be in Dijal's paradise and not even realize it mm -hmm. because his paradise is where all this technology and ease and comfort and his vaccines and all the things he's going to tell you that are going to make your life wonderful. And you'll just keep taking them and keep taking them until you start to see with Basira, the spiritual reality of all this stuff, how destructive it is, how much facade is involved in it. And then you start moving in the opposite direction and go to the places that he calls hell, right? Oh, that's hell to go live uh, 
off the grid or grow your own food. Oh man, it's so tough. Yeah. Right. But what are you, what, what are you losing in the process? Your soul. And that's what Dajjal's paradise is. His technological paradise is it destroys your soul. It, it causes a massive amount of sins to be laden upon you because of all the facade you're causing yourself and everything around you by living in it. Right. So it's just something to think about, you know, get motivated, especially you're a young person. You have the energy, like get, get to work now. Inshallah, inshallah. Okay. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa nashad wa da'i da'i da'anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ashhadu an la